Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Allison Hurrier, and I head up the textile arts curriculum at Portland State University. For those of you who are joining us from outside the university, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We offer courses in weaving, surface design, sewing construction, and dress history that encourage students to develop, to develop portfolios for a variety of applications in apparel, costume, textiles, and contemporary art. This is one of several free public events that we are hosting this term where we bring in outside perspectives to supplement our current course offerings. Please feel free to visit our website or subscribe to our newsletter to stay posted about our upcoming programming. Um, we will be announcing our spring term calendar very, very soon. Um, this evening, we are so thrilled to be hosting Crystal Gregory as our guest in the Weaving Pattern and Structure course that's taught by the amazing Shelley Sokolovsky. Before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge that we are joining you all from Portland State University, which is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous populations whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of Chinook, the Tualatin Kayapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. And in remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. As I mentioned earlier, we are so thrilled to welcome Crystal Gregory. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to both uh, Shelly and Crystal who are gonna be taking you through our events for the evening. Thank you so much, Crystal. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen if that Let's start this. And I would like to go ahead and introduce you, Crystal, before you begin, and also let everyone know that we're going to be holding off on asking questions directly during Crystal's talk, but we can put them in the chat and we will watch the chat. And then at the end of Crystal's talk, we can um, address the questions. So with that, let me introduce Crystal Gregory. Crystal is a sculptor whose work investigates the intersections between textile and architecture. She received her BFA from the University of Oregon and her MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago from Fiber and Material Studies Department. In 2013, she was awarded the Lenore Annenberg Fellowship for the Performing and Visual Arts. With this grant, she moved to Amsterdam, Netherlands, where she took a role as guest artist at the Garrick Riedfeld Academy of Art. Her work has been exhibited in museums and galleries nationally, including Through the Thread at the Rockwell Museum of Art, Devotion, Destruction, Craft, Inheritance at Dorsky Gallery Curatorial Projects, Load Bearing, The Art of Construction at the Hunterton Art Museum, and Crossover, a black and white project space, and has been reviewed in publications such as Hyperallergic, Surface Design Journal, Art Critical, and Peripheral Vision Press. Gregory is an assistant professor within the School of Arts and Visual Studies at the University of Kentucky, and currently shows with Tappan Collective in Los Angeles, California, as well as Momentum Gallery in North Carolina. We are so happy to have you, Crystal. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, hello, and thank you for being here. Um, and what a beautiful, um, uh, land acknowledgement, Allison, and I'm going to do my own, but it's not as um, kind of well-rounded as yours. So I'm joining you virtually from Lexington, Kentucky, which is the central part of our state. And I want to uh, recognize the indigenous people who have always lived here on this land that we call Kentucky and who live here today. So the place we now call Kentucky is prim primarily Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Osage land. Uh, thank you to Allison for putting this together. These have been wonderful artist and designer talks and thank you for archiving them. Um, I've had the pl pleasure to watch a handful of them already and they're, they're a treat, they really are. Um, so I'm honored to be a part of that, that archive. And also to Shelly, um, 
who's just been such a wonderful model for me. I got to take tapestry class from Shelly uh, at the University of Oregon while I was pursuing my BFA. Uh, and she taught me so much more than just the construction of weaving elements. So I think it's really because of her that I've been set on this path. Um, one of many people that have like enriched my, my weaving life. So really thank you. And thank you for having me here. So um, yeah, okay. I approach my practice with my hands. I approach my practice through my body, through making, touching, twisting, understanding materials, expanding my understanding of those materials, playing and sharing. I approach my practice as a sculptor who considers space and time within everything I do. The time it takes to listen to a material and learn about its histories, its associations, its story. The time it takes in making to get to know my personal relationships with my materials, as well as the relationships others have to those materials. I chose an art practice that incorporates long processes like weaving to give me the time I feel is necessary to really know the material hours in which my hands are moving and my mind has the space to develop my thinking. It's really a gift to be asked to lecture on my practice because it follows or it allows for a thoughtful reflection of my work as a whole. Through designing or crafting this lecture, I'm able to step back and look at the work, some of which I produced more than 15 years ago and see how it is still in direct conversation with the work that I'm working on today. It allows for new create, uh, create to create new linkages and give new understandings of old work, oh, old works. So last year I was asked to write a practitioner's essay for Francis and Taylor textile journal. Um, it was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done. And, um, you know, writing doesn't come easy for me. It's a very slow and kind of hard fought discipline, but like creating this lecture, it's proved to be a huge help um, to think about my work and my practice in new ways, drawing out overarching themes, allowing time to paint clearer and more expansive definitions for myself. So I thought for this lecture, I would use some of that text and expand upon the sculptures in different series um, that are directly applicable to the text. So this lecture is really gonna be uh, more of a mashup between that writing and individual project narratives. And I'm hoping um, with this to stitch those individual projects together and conceptualize it through the writing. Um, so I hope it works. And I, I'll be very interested on your thoughts um, after, after the lecture. So um, let's see. Can you all see this or are the um, images in the way or the faces in the way? No, we see it. Oh, okay. Um, so this is a quote from Annie Albers. If the nature of architecture is the grounded, the fixed, the permanent, then textiles are its very antithesis. If, however, we think of the process of building and the process of weaving and compare the work involved, we will find similarities despite the vast difference in scale. Annie Albers explains, if architecture is fixed and permanent, then the opposite would be a textile, collapsible and movable. Any further consideration would show more common links than differences. Both mediums define space, create shelter, and allow for privacy. A textile, however, has the advantage of flexibility. It's a semi-two-dimensional plane that has the ability to fold, drape, move, and change to its surroundings. It is pliable. My work, um, my work uses cloth construction as a fundamental center, a place to start from and to move back to. With a background in weaving, I ultimately see myself as a builder and draw clear connections between the lines of thread laid perpendicularly through a warp and the construction of architectural spaces. The suppleness of a thread gives it the ability to adapt, to fold and meander, be put under tension and support weight. Thus, the argument for a textile thought is for that of structural suppleness or a thought practice that allows the joining of paradox and intersections of varying parts. A woven structure is 
open enough to carry its complex history and simultaneously hold space for the newness of a present context. The parameters of weaving and architecture, their process, their utility, and ultimately their grid are sturdy and stable and at the same time malleable and absorbent. I hope to connect architecture and textile through their relationships to movement the movement described by and remembered through the outlining material landscapes. Um, so I'm not an architect. I'm not a designer or a practitioner of architecture. I'm a witness, an individual who experiences the arrangements of movements that a built space impresses upon the body, a witness of the collected uses of spaces. To understand architecture and textiles wholly, we need to engage a physicality the felt and lived experience becomes larger than the material that makes up each thread, street, or building. So as an undergraduate, I studied um, fiber. Um, weaving in particular was a, a big love of mine. I took all the classes that I could and was in, completely passionate about it. Um, and then in my last semester, I was asked by my professor, why, why are you weaving? Why, why does this have to be a weaving? And it really stumped me. It, um, I don't think he meant for it to be such a hard question, but like many things, when something rings true, it really resonates. Um, it haunted me, this question haunted me. And for the years that followed, I, I, it put me on a path where I was making um, a lot of work around textiles, around um, their formal and um, technical considerations, but I wasn't touching cloth or thread. So this first series that I want to share with you um, was three sculptures, the first one being 2009, the second 2010, and then again revisited in 2017. Um, they're all made of, of drywall that's been carved through um, in textile pattern. So the work really um, exposed sort of the interior structures of, of these construction materials. For this piece, um, it was titled For Jane as a 10 by nine foot wall, uh, incorporated dust that I collected through the carving process laid out on the floor in reflection of the pattern um, in the wall. This piece was a physical translation in my mind of the story of the yellow wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, the Yellow Wallpaper is a short fiction considered to be one of the first feminist writings uh, within the United States. It's written in the first person and is about a woman whose husband diagnoses her with hysteria and prescribes her to spend time resting for months on end in isolation. Over the arc of the narrative, our character starts to have hallucinations of a woman trapped inside the wallpaper and the room she is confined to. Um, the story climaxes with our character clawing through the wallpaper with an effort to release the woman captured inside. And this is sort of the work that came out of that. Um, I think I was trying to mash up this idea of the domestic and ornament and have it sort of invade the structural or the thing that's confining it. Um, so this, this work to me has a lot of emotion and a lot of um, tension in it. This is the next one in the series um, and it's the same work, it's carved drywall, but this time I've kind of pushed it further in scale to a room size sculpture, uh, large enough for the viewer to walk through. This work had two very distinct experiences. From the inside, you were um, within this canopy of cast shadow and light. And then from the outside, as you walked around it, you could really see the deterioration and the way that the construction was crumbling by this sort of forced um, invading erosion of ornaments. <clears throat> um, and then again, this last work, uh, was titled Cut Work, still considering all of the same themes. Um, but, it, but for this one, I was really interested in looking at cut work as in um, the lace process where you're cutting away different parts of woven fabrics and then creating um, structure reinforcement stitches to allow for a structural edge so that the fray is contained. Um, yeah.
So <clears throat> most of us have inherited our built landscape, our towns, our streets, our cities. We're born onto a place and sometimes we leave it either voluntarily or by force for a new place. The architecture that surrounds us guides our movements and gives us a framework on which we build our daily routines. Architecture constrains movements through streets, hallways, and walls. It holds the body completely, inhibiting and confining. Shelley McNama, co-founder of the Grafton Architects, considers architecture as operating beyond the visual and emphasizes the role of architecture as choreographer of daily life. If, if architecture is choreographer, then the body is the choreographed, carrying out assigned movements enforced by the parameters of the city's streets, walls, and passageways. Just as a thread weaves its way through the network of warp, so does a body perform a guided choreography through an architectural space. The built landscape shapes the movements of its residents as each individual finds their way to their destination. Paths are carved, imprinted, and repeated. Relationships are forged, responding to, and defined by space and place. Architecture is a set of boundaries that directs the movement of a body through space. It is a story of a, citizen, a citizen's imprinting their actions onto the surface of a place. The containment of the body within the boundaries of architectural structure is parallel to the confinement of a weft thread, which lies within the gridded network of a cloth. Each thread lays as an individual next to their neighbor. The thread holds onto its individuality while it adds to color and texture of the cloth. Each individual thread is responsible for the makeup of the whole, a participation in intersecting parts. Similarly, or sorry, similarly, an individual citizen's activity within a place creates a change activated over time and space. The pedestrians walking each on their, um, with their own destination in mind, weaving their way through streets and intersections creates a constant flow. Bodies in motion become the swell of people. This energy gives the city its identity, an accumulation of citizens crossing, intersecting, making up a network, a moving fabric. In weaving, the interlacement of pliable lines creates a grid. Its materiality allows a freedom of movement within a structured system. The inverse is true for the built um, environment. The rigidity of an architectural material defines the space, allowing for movement within the interior. I imagine this comparison of movement to be one and the same, a dancing through the grid or a dancing of the grid, but neither are still. The negative space between the rigidity allows for an open quality of flow, folding and unfolding in many directions at once. So, like I said about um, kind of ha having that question posed, why weave? It took me about um, maybe five years of searching, making a lot of work through a lot of different materials, um, construction materials about and kind of for textiles. So I was carving um, drywall, I was using glass, metal, concrete, all to sort of understand textiles, which as I'm saying that sounds um, sounds kind of backwards, but it actually was an incredible practice to get to the point of like, what is it about the fabric that I'm so in, in, enticed by? And trying to force all of these building materials to do something that a fabric does um, was a, a fool's errand and also like proved to me um, what what I'm after or what I'm looking for. It allowed me a, a real confidence and a real, um, I don't know, sincerity once I got back to the loom and sat down. Um, so this series is the that I'm about to share with you is probably the longest series I've been working through. Um, started in 2013 in my last year of graduate school. Um, and I finally sat down at the loom <clears throat> Um, so these works are all woven concrete 
Um, I've embedded woven mostly laces, but some very simple structured textiles into concrete. The works are material paintings. They hang on the wall and invite the viewer to experience them as abstract paintings of brightly colored lines and meandering grids. Yet they ask more in their viewing, in their materiality, their history, their utilitarian uses, their surface and their texture. Material and their cultural association, I believe lie at the core of this work. And I really work to unpack the meaning within lace and con concrete and find those contradictions. I incorporate the inherent contradictions of these materials into their conceptual strategy. So in contemporary culture, we really think about concrete as something, as a symbol of strength. It's structural, it's stable. Um, in many ways, it's, it's the opposite of a textile. Uh, it's cold, hard, and heavy. It's a compression material. It exerts strength by being able to withstand weight. Um, being piled onto it. And yet without reinforcement, which is often a woven mesh of metal, um, the concrete is very fragile. It's very prone to crack and crumble and reveals an inability to adjust. Textile, on the other hand, are soft and pliable. They, um, they also are incredibly strong but in a different, in a tinsel property. So tinsel, prop, um, tinsel strength is that of a pull force. So if you think about like rope or being a, a hammock, being able to withstand the weight this way instead of on top of. Um, so these physical characteristics, I feel somehow um, in our culture get assigned hierarchies, often associating them with gender or sexuality. <clears throat> but on closer look, we are able to rearrange these understandings of strengths and weaknesses and ultimately see the value of um, varying strengths as useful in different, in different ways. <clears throat> um, so this work I, is really formal. Uh, I get to play with color and form and make in a lot of different modes. The weaving process, as you all know, is very slow and meticulous. And I get to play at the loom with color and texture and watch the weaving, respond to the weaving as it grows. Once I reach the end of the warp, I take the tension off and I really see the fabric for the first time and use it again as a, as a new raw material. <clears throat> um, so at that moment, I get to arrange and compose the, the fabric, finally committing to a kind of design or um, an effect that I'm interested in. Um, and then I get to permanently cast it into concrete. So that mode of making is very um, fast and dusty and heavy. Um, and and it's, it just feels like a very well-rounded um, parameter that I've set up for myself within the series. Um, and in the end, I get to I get to kind of capture this movement, but in in the moment of stillness, a stopped a stopped thread. So, <clears throat> a grid allows for two things to meet, be impacted by one another, and then part. Strangers passing each other on the street and chance encounters. At the intersection of warp and weft, a negotiation must be made. One thread must pass over and the other must pass under. This may not change the individual thread, but it greatly affects the makeup of the textile. The meeting of warp and weft creates the pattern in the fabric, the drape and ultimately its utility. In some ways, a gridded space promotes individualism. However, the network of a weaving or a city grid also allows um, a macro level inviting connectivity. These materials work both as an individual paths, thread or street, and as unit, network and community. In her essay, The Solitary Stroller and the City, Rebecca Solnit writes of the walker being the thread of the city's fabric. She says, walking is only the beginning of citizenship, but through it, the citizen knows his or her city and fellow citizens and truly inhabits the city rather than a small 
privatized part thereof. Walking the streets is what links up reading the map with living one's life, the personal microcosm with the public macrocosm, end quote. For Solnet, the citizens are the microcosm of the public's macrocosm. Each individual walker holds their interests and values, and then those accumulate into subcultures, and subculture upon subculture ultimately creates a cultural identity. Um, so for this next project uh, that I'd like to share with you, I was really interested in looking at the weave structure of overshot. Um, I, I guess a little context within that, I um, moved to Lexington, Kentucky from New York City and felt, and maybe still do, feel like an outsider. Um, I had never lived in this region of the country and had a lot of associations um, with the South. And so I thought that I would sort of study the culture here through what is a very traditional regional um, weave structure, the colonial coverlet, which you can see here. So um, overshot is a weave structure that utilizes systems of supplementary floats to create complex patterns. The fabric is made up of two very distinct parts, the ground cloth, which in this slide is orange, um, which is the most basic interlacement of plain weave, and supplementary floats, which create complex patterns and add dimension to the surface of the textile. So here the, the floats are in gray. These supplementary wefts are not integral to the structure of the cloth. In fact, without the ground cloth, the pattern would just fall away. This pattern depends on the rigidity of the grid to hold itself together. The pattern floats are bound down into the cloth in sequence, floating above and then being woven in in turn. Overshot is, like I said, known as being a colonial textile. It was brought to the Americas by uh, Northern European novice weavers and used for its simplicity of structure and equip equipment. So these um, few slides are from John Landis' um, pattern book, which is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And he was a co uh, colonial time weaver um, who left this incredible draft book. Um, actually, they're not, there's no draft notations in it, but it is the, the patterns that he would weave. And it's just really beautiful. So I wanted to share that part with you. Um, so the complexity of the patterning was very much developed and thrived in the American continent. Similarly, colonialism th thrived on this American continent. Um, so as a new faculty teaching at the University of Kentucky, I felt I needed to educate myself on these complexities and somehow get to know the place I'm now living through studying this weave structure. With this work, I arrived at more questions than answers, but I believe the piece created reflects those questions and hopefully engages um, in a conversation. So um, in my school, sculptural work, What Binds Us, which is in this three-person show, it's this piece here. Um, I consider overshot pattern both for its structure and for its poetry. As a viewer approached the sculpture, they were confronted with a 10-foot concrete wall. As one walked around, um, they noticed that two walls are actually leaning away from one another in this precarious balance. The side view revealed the strength of thousands of wool threads supporting the weight of two monumental leaning walls. These threads were bound into the surface of the textile in overshot pattern and submerged into the surface of the wall using concrete. The title of this work, What Binds Us, is a physical description of the question posed. The patterned thread float floats over the surface and then is bound down at points, leaving traces of bold and complex pattern over the surface of the fabric. Pattern threads expend off the surface of the wall and then were tied to the facing wall, exerting an expression of balance and support. For this work, I invited five um, artists in Lexington to help me install the sculpture. 
We spent the, the afternoon tying knots from one side of the sculpture to the other. This group of participants were from all over the country and actually the world based in Lexington because of the university. But we all shared this common place in this common moment. We talked together about the project and the idea um, of that, um, sorry, ideas of support and constraint. The act of tying together is a gesture of connection as we had attempt to unpack ideas of tension and balance. The ground cloth grants a certain freedom to the pattern threads in an overshot to be unburdened by the work of creating a stable structure. But at the same time, these pattern threads are constrained or bound into the grid of the cloth. So sort of mimicking that duality, the threads in my sculpture exhibited an inspiring feat of strength by holding up these heavy leaning walls and at the same time were burdened by their effort. So I think, again, this piece is um, emotionally complex. The actions of the materials are both heroic and, and sort of stuck. <clears throat> so um, the movement of the grid within a woven textile and a city is the undertaking of connected parts. I hold on to the individual within the grid identified in my context as the thread or the pedestrian. In a weaving, individual threads hold on to their particular texture and color. They are not changed by the threads they lie next to. The colors and textures mix and evolve only when seen as at a distance, when the city or the fabric is viewed as a whole. In the grid, I find an open structure able to contain complexities. I find intersecting ideas that, when woven together, create new ideas that are greater than the sum of their parts. The grid is open enough for ideas to meander and grow and still structural enough to be mapped. The grid, in my mind, is the binary plus. At a micro scale, one intersection can be encountered at a time. On a macro scale, a multitude of intersections are woven together to create a whole made up of millions of momentary intersections that are ever shifting and ever changing. Um, oh, sorry, let me go back one. So in the end, textiles and architecture are only the outline for the lives that, for the life that occurs within their boundaries. Their edges, their selvages, their borders, mimic their streets, the walls, and hallways, all holding space for the body and for movement. The materials are only the edges, the definition or the outline, but they help us to define and organize the intangible. They help to define the rhythms and shapes that bodies moving through space can create. Merce Cunningham writes about time being the connector of movement. In dancing, he says, space and time cannot be disconnected, end quote. A body moving over a period of time projects an elusive shape through space. In dance, as in walking, each action or gesture accumulates to create a larger composition across the stage or through a city. A dancer, a walker, a weaver, each draws shapes with movement through space. The walker leaves home to make their way to the other side of town, carving a familiar path. The dancer practices a choreographed movement, each step calculated, thoughtful, and designed. The weaver is the only one, let me see if I can. The weaver is the only one of the three who leaves behind a physical trace of their action. With each weft thread laid through the warp, a record is kept tangible and pliable, of a body reaching and throwing, feet pressing pedals in sequence, hands passing a shuttle with movements that are connected in space and time. I propose space can be shaped by the movements that unfold within it. A fabric encages movements, responding to each external push and pull with an internal pliability. Architecture outlines movements, slowly refining itself with a building with a building's discrete borders as described by each well-carved path. Gaston Bouchelard 
describes the snail building its shell and likens it to the animal forming a spiral staircase. Just as the snail, he says, contorts itself in order to advance and grow, an end quote, our movement through space creates form, both physically and psychologically. Our movements expand to fill the space allotted by our surroundings, contorting and contrasting as we move and change. Um, so this next project was first shown at 21C Museum in um, the winter of 2020, and then shown again at Spring Break Art Show, art, art show um, of March 2020. So imagine the COVID was like just hitting New York City as, as I was exiting. <laughs> um, and the title of this piece is The Event of the Thread. So that title is a title that's been used by many artists in recent years. Uh, I think most famously Anne Hamilton's 2013 work at the Park Avenue Armory. But the title goes back further than that. It's a co it's a co opted title and refers back to 1965 when Annie Albers described quote the event of a thread as something multilinear, without beginning or end. More broadly, it meant the, co the constant possibility of reassessing relationships and structuring, restructuring connections. So to me, the title suggests movement, action, and performance, something that is never still and is in constant state of becoming. As a thread is laid out in the warp, it is put under tension and required to march either an up or down movement. As a thread is laid in the weft, it meanders under or over its counterpart warp threads until released from the tension of the loom and allowed to shape shift, to conform to a, a new circumstance or a new surrounding. Whether um, in the building of a weaving or the movement of a textile, the thread is not a still object. So in my installation, um, my chosen materials were those of support and transition industrial scaffolding, concrete pipes, and handwoven textiles. In this installation, the utilitarian materials are taken from their natural environment and are asked to exhibit systems of support for one another. I use the industrial materials to stretch and support the weaving created, creating a, a sort of second loom in the gallery. In this work, I was playing with double weave, which is a process of weaving that allows the weaver to um, weave in multiple layers on the same warp. So you can weave yardage of um, uh, weaving that's twice the width of your loom. You can weave two layers and at the same time that are separate from one another. You can weave pockets. I mean, it goes on and on. Those were really the three that I was playing with um, um, in, in this project. Um, so with this weave structure, the weaver can really play with textile as a three-dimensional object. Um, so for this work, I had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with a modern dance company called The Moving Architects. Uh, and that clip I showed of the dancer earlier was of the same dance company. So working closely with the director and choreographer, Aaron Carlisle Norton, as well as um, Ashley and Bailey, these two wonderful dancers here. We talked about the movements of making a cloth in the studio. We talked about the movements surrounding the utility of a textile and the emotional gestures that we find um, that we wanted to kind of express through this work. We workshopped and rehearsed for three days in my studio, as well as at the museum. And the piece um, we formed incorporates phrases of actions and movements that describe strength and release, support and pliability, force and softness. So this was just such a wonderful experience for me. I'm still sort of unpacking it and, and hoping to have a second um, chance to collaborate with this, with this group this coming summer. Um, because the worlds of dance and sculpture are so distant from one another, but I feel like we have so much, we have so much work to do and it's, it's super exciting. 
Um, but for this installation, uh, it sort of opened with the dance performance live. Um, the dancers flew in to Kentucky from New Jersey. That's where they're based. Um, and then over the course of the rest of the uh, exhibition, I sort of, not sort of, I maintained the installation, meaning I changed the composition of the concrete and textile every week. Um, I actively maintained this sculpture, shifting and changing the composition of materials to create, um, to mimic the postures and gestures that were uncovered through the performance. Um, and I really wanted to sort of play with time again, even though viewers to the museum over the rest of the six week exhibition uh, saw it maybe once, maybe twice, the arc of the narrative was still evolving and the composition I, I don't think ever really stopped. So even though it was still when somebody saw it, it was moving over time, um, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, so Bachelard, again, Gaston Bachelard, looks at the phenomenological, the psychological and the imagined to define space. Through Bachelard's writings, we see home and cities become anthropomorphized acting as protector and nurturers. We can imagine the feeling of a fabric against our limbs or the way the city surrounds and envelops the body. And we understand an intimate sensitivity to this material awareness. These materials require an attention to negotiating the placement of our individual bodies within their space. That's why when we experience a vulner, or sorry, that is why we experience vulnerability in or an awareness of the body's edges when we encounter a new environment. But with repetition, we use, um, with, with repetition and use, we create inroads and we begin to wear our surroundings as a second skin. Our textiles have the potential to become an extension of ourselves and our architectural environment can become an extension of our body. We begin to wear our city like a shell. With movement and use, we begin to feel safe and comforted. We gain an intimate connection to the place we inhibit. Um, okay. Each repeated journey carves a deeper gro groove into the well-worn path, like the erosion of a riverbed. The linear progression of individuals finding their way from one place to another place creates an ever-flowing current of people. In the city, stillness is found in the rigidity of the architectural materials set at points of reference to witness, the flow, the cyclical nature, the use of a city. So this last uh, project that I'm going to share with you this evening is super recent. I just finished the installation of it um, in December and it's the largest piece that I've, I've made to date. And um, I'm really, it really allowed me to grow um, in a lot of ways. Uh, its title is Weight in a Field of Color. It's a site-specific project created for the stairwell of the Credit Human Bank building in San Antonio. This work consists of seven 30 feet, 30 foot weavings installed for the, from the 11th floor to the fifth floor um, up the staircase. Each textile incorporates a stainless steel ball chain into sort of the base right here um, of these brightly colored cotton warps. And the ball chain really was there to add weight to create shape um, of these sort of U's or J's. But I, I also loved the the kind of contradiction that this really um, kind of lowbrow um, material ball chain giving this reflective and kind of metallic um, elevation to, to this project. So as the viewer circles around the staircase, they experience this piece from many different angles, flipping the role of architecture and textile. 
the textile becomes the monumental. This project made me think about how a fabric is usually the smallest, most intimate space that, that a person carries. Expanding that idea outward, it's easy to see the correlation between, um, between the space between clothing and skin and the space between clothing and ceiling as comparable. They're both spaces that envelop your body, both materials that have a great effect on our individual identity and ultimately help to condition a person. So I, I really see them as shaping, the environment shaping um, kind of who we are. Building a weaving requires repetitive actions that develop and emerge out of one another. Each step is dependent on the one before and thoughtful of the step after. A weaving is growing, developing, adding, and changing. It's pliant and constantly in motion. I think about my weaving practice as a living research. It's both linear and cyclical in nature, requiring constant care and upkeep for advancement. I engage ultimately in two identities simultaneously, weaver and witness. Each helps to define the other. As the weaver, building a textile line by line, like a carpenter or mason, I have a tactile understanding of how my materials act and how they react. I know how they respond and how they exhibit strength. I know the heroics of pliability and the security of rigidity. As the witness, I understand the repetition of everyday events. I am a witness as I walk into the studio building each day, up the stairwell and through the halls. I witness my movements encaged by the shape of the building, the choreography of that repeated action that is impressed upon my body, just as the weft thread moves through tensioned warp threads under and over in pattern. My materials as my identities hold space for complexity, for paradox and for movement, and not only movement, but for growth. These intersections allow for thousands of tiny impacts resulting in a fabric that is greater than the sum of its parts. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, Crystal. I am just like salivating at these visuals oh. that you provided us and I would, I would love to read. I feel like you should publish your writing. It uh, is published. Great, because I would love to. I would love to obtain a copy. I. I want to relish. I want to take time to relish what you're saying, because as a weaver, I can, you know, appreciate all of it, and I really want to sit with it. Right. Um, so you're gonna have to tell us about yeah. how to access that publication for one thing. Yeah, it's um. It's gonna be, in, or it is out at um, online right now at um, Taylor and Francis Cloth and Culture, but mm -hmm. it will be like an edited vol volume, um, hopefully next time or this time next year. Um, but yeah, it was it was it's something that I'm not used to. Writing is is new for me, so it took me took it took me like I get it. Time. Yeah. <laughs> understand it but some of the things you were saying I can completely understand I can I res it resonates with me um and I never really thought consciously about that so there's like a lot of you're you're you're, you're putting words to a lot of the things that I I feel innately but it was fabulous mm -hmm. um and also I want to say that my students that are in this class we are right now currently learning double cloth double weave oh, and perfect. so that was really excellent um yeah. maybe I'll go back to this slide yeah, Jay, Jay, some of my students are chiming in in the chat. Yeah, they are pretty fantastic. So they can certainly appreciate what they're saying uh, okay. and the labor that's involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the ball chain, is that like, tell us about that material. I'm curious. Uh, um, you know, I realized as I was flipping through these so fast that I left out that like one image that shows the ball chain very um, close up. But um, let me see if I can find a good one. Hmm. Sorry about that. Yeah, so if you think of ball chain, it's, you know, it's 
used in plumbing, it's used in electrical work. You know, the, if you think of like the, the light that you pull the ball chain. Um, and I kind of, I had done this series before where I've been um, casting um, molten pewter into my weavings. So I found sort of a, a, a sweet spot where the, the, the pewter is a low enough um, melting point that it won't actually burn or won't burn too much the cotton. Um, and the this project, they really liked that work, but that work is, it's very precarious and it's hard to um, reproduce at a really large scale. And so I was thinking about like, how, how can I put metal back into this? And I happened to have some ball chain in my studio and I wove it in as weft. Um, and it, it was really, actually I have a little sample right here. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I don't. Um, it's the the ball chain sits like perfectly in between each of the each of the warp threads um, and kind of pops through in this really re resilient and kind of reflective um, metal. So brilliant. Yeah. yeah, this piece is is new. So they're still um, um, the gallery is still kind of collecting the images, but they shot it with a drone. So you'll be able to see the whole thing in. Um, in one kind of short clip. Exactly, the talk opened up, someone is saying here that the talk has opened up some beautiful um, ways to think about environment and space. Absolutely, I mean, that's that's what's so incredible about the, the seeming soft pliable plane yet being so much stronger say than the concrete. That was pretty mm -hmm. phenomenal with that leaning piece. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. This one, um, what binds us? Let me get to it. Was kind of scary to make, <laughs> and, and a feat of engineering for sure. Um, but it it worked. I mean, I had all of these safety precautions set up yeah. so that you know just in case these 400 pound walls were to fall over in the gallery but in the end they um the safety precautions were slack and all of these wool threads were the thing carrying that weight um so it you know even though i had backup plan it it proved itself to be unnecessary yeah that's amazing um Allison is asking, how much did you think about sight when creating the, I guess, maybe Allison's speaking of the piece that's in Texas. I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, I did. I definitely got to go there. And um, the, the site was a huge consideration, not only for space. Um, I ended up building like a, a, a scale model in my studio and kept playing um, around with the, the way the stair staircase would move and it was so fun to work on because um, especially that project it's not just 210 feet you know it's it's um, a series of intimate moments the people in the building get you know within reach of it um, so there there's no, no room to hide you know all of those micro moments that you get to experience as a weaver were able to be experienced, but then it also expanded out into um, a really large architectural scale too. Um, and then the other kind of part of the site that I took into a lot of consideration was color. And because it was um, San Antonio, um, I think also very much because it was made during a um, pandemic and it was very, it, I, I feel we needed color, like we need color, <laughs> we, need, we need to have this bright, bold kind of happiness. Um, I needed to make that, I needed to, I needed to be around those colors um, and I think living around them is, can be helpful too. Um, but yeah, so the color and the scale, I mean the site was very much part and then also you know I directly tied onto the staircase I had initially thought that I was going to be um, um, 
installing like metal brackets underneath the staircase. But in the end, it worked out to tie it directly to the stairs. Um, so I don't know, I think the site is very much incorporated in that piece. What about light? Are you concerned about um, direct sunlight on the piece or how did you navigate that? Um, yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> is, is there direct sunlight hitting it? It seems like a very light space, but it could just be this. Right. Yeah, I mean, it was a question that I posed to the designers. So the north wall of the building is all windows. Um, I don't think that there is ever a point that there's like a beating beam on the piece. Um, and the building is actually made um, sustainably conscious of that. So they they have built in design feature of um, blinds that are reactive to the sunlight. So, and, and with that um, climate control is, is incorporated. Um, actually, I think doesn't Portland State have a really good um, architectural design, sustainability. Yeah, so you guys know. Um, you're probably like more up on it than I was, but it's, it's, it was a, a very cool building. They had, um, I think it was 95% um, um, solar panel, like their energy was all not, uh, taken care of. And they were like 97% um, water taken care of. So like using all of their own collected water for gray water. I think the only thing that they're bringing in was drinking water. Um, yeah. And they trusted me to, you know, make a big piece. So. Well, that's a really good question. There's a question in the chat uh, about lighting. And did you consciously consider the translucency of the textile and how yeah. the light travels through it? I would think so. Yes. Yeah. And what is the material that, what, what is the material makeup here? So the weavings are, um, they're very simple. They're, they're um, laced in a huck lace pattern and it's mostly plain weave playing with stripes, um, both in the warp and the weft. And then there are sections of huck lace and then huck sh uh, sections of spaced weave. Um, so you can see that there's just, you know, I inserted. Um, is it a cotton or a bamboo or what is the material? Yeah, it's mercerized cotton, 10-2, mercerized cotton. Mm -hmm. um, and this project was also a huge uh, leap for me because I got to hire two assistants, two weavers. Um, so not only was it, um, you know, scale, it was also figuring out a mode of communication uh, because as you can see, these weavings are not straightforward. Like every, every few inches they change um, pattern and design. So it was a, a, a huge learning process for me and for you know them to collaborate on how to communicate and how to stay involved in all of the decision making processes, um, but also use somebody else's hand to throw, you know, throw the shuttle. Um, Exactly, because even our beating, even our beating is going to be different according to your strength and how hard you're pulling it. So it's really, it's really challenging and it's really fantastic to be able to um, try to make your hand vis invisible, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. but still make something hand, like, yeah, hand, <laughs> hand, you know, like it's a, it's yes. like a, there's a paradox there for sure. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Any other questions for? for Crystal. Well, thank you guys so much. I wish that I was um, in Portland. I know. Maybe someday soon. Please, please. And um, and you, did you say that you're getting your TC2, your digital loom set up at the university? Is yes. it right now? Yes, actually, maybe I'll do a little plug. So we um, are small, we're very small, um, really wonderful art school. <laughs> um, and if anybody is interested in graduate um, work like MFA, we offer a lot of funding, like a, a very competitive funding. Um, we have an, a new TC2 program. So um, yeah, reach out if you're interested and we can talk further about that. That's great. That's mm -hmm. So would you mind putting the link in the chat for us? The link to our website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, I think I will. Um, let me see. 
Honestly, I'm mean, sorry. I didn't mean to put you yeah. on the spot. <laughs> I, I'm just like, what is our website? <laughs> <laughs> or you know what? We can uh, we can share out that information too, like later. It's not a big deal. So okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I might need to. Sure. <laughs> to look that up yeah oh, that's yeah great. um sh- like shelly can share it with her class and, and we'll we'll email out the event right yeah so okay cool yeah i have a um instagram for the fiber studio it's uky fiber okay very good <laughs> great <laughs> this one, it was fabulous thank you so much for sharing and i do want to get a copy of that publication so yes. you keep me in the loop about that that too. cool okay. Thank you. It's so nice talking. Yeah, to thank you, Crystal. And thank you to everyone who is in attendance this evening. Um, we are, we have been recording this and there will be a recording up um, next week on our uh, archive, um, which I'll go ahead and put that in the chat for you all right now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming and joining us this evening. We hope that you can join us on March 2nd for Dais Matthews talk. Um, she's going to be talking about fashion and black activism on the college campus. It should be a really great discussion. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Crystal. It was so great uh, to have you with us and, and we'll be in touch. So thank you everyone. Have a fantastic evening. Thanks everyone. See you soon.